All right. And in the interest of time, I think we can get started. So um, this is the DHA FTA Retail Flexible Funding Model, RFFM Grant Program Webinar. Um, we're really excited to have you all. And I'm really excited to turn it over to our FTA Project Officer, Mary Beth Neeson. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to take a minute to welcome you all to the webinar and I hope that you get a lot of information out of this. Um, NEHA has been a wonderful partner in the application process and handling all the grants once they're issued. They are a wealth of knowledge. So uh, questions today, questions later to their 1-800 number or email, um, you're welcome to do that. Um, I'm currently staying in St. Louis at the mentorship end of your meeting, so I won't be staying the entire time. I want to go down and hear all the good works they've been doing, but I wanted to make sure I took a moment to um, encourage you to apply, encourage you to ask questions if you don't know um, how something should work or if you have a unique situation. Um, NEHA is happy to help with those things. They work with FDA in the background to make sure that we get you the answers you need. So please don't hesitate to do that. And I hope you all have a great webinar. Jenna, I'll toss it over to you. Thanks, Mary Beth. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Jenna Brown. I am part of the grant program support team here. Uh, with NEHA on this program. And um, I'm going to be walking you through some of the basics of the grant program, um, trying to go through a little bit quickly. You do have access to these slides on the website, um, as well as all of this information is in the grant guidance. Um, some of these slides are going to get a little wordy, but we do want this to have a good amount of information for everyone um, as you are considering your applications. Um, we do encourage you to ask questions. We want to have plenty of time at the end for questions. Um, if you can, please use that Q&A uh, bubble icon you have at the bottom of your screen. Um, those are just a little easier for us to export, but if you are posting things in the chat, we will try to get to those as well. <clears throat> okay, so just um, some reminders about the benefits of the retail program standards, the goals and benefits um, we are looking to promote inspectional uniformity and consistency uh, with this voluntary program. Um, you get to move through it at your own pace. Um, we're promoting relationships with other jurisdictions, state, local, tribal, and territorial networks. And we are hoping to have those networks assist each other and receive assistance uh, when needed. Um, all registered food protection jurisdictions are welcome to apply for the program. And we're hoping to build the integrated food safety system uh, through this work. So some things this year are remaining the same. Um, you still have to be enrolled in the retail program standards uh, to, to qualify for any of these grants. If you have questions about how to do that, if you need to see if you're enrolled, please reach out to us. Um, retailgrants at neha.org is our email address, um, but we have that later on the slides um, or post it in the chat. We can walk you through that process. Um, the grant program registration information is all still found um, at neha.org uh, forward slash retail slash grants. Um, all of the grant guidance, all of these uh, webinars, all of that can be found there and the FAQs from this webinar. Um, you're going to be using the same grant portal that you always have. This is where you'll apply as a new user uh, for an account or you can use your existing login and password to get in. And you're still going to have nearly a full year to complete the work on your project. Um, and then most of the grant category funding is going to remain the same with a few key differences that we'll go through in this presentation. Thanks. Okay, so some things uh, that are improvements for this year, um, improvements and, and um, changes. Um, we have three-year grants available again for CY 2025 to 2027. Um, and we have moved to combined applications for all three base grants. So track one, track two, and track three are all um, combined applications that include base outcomes, a mentee optional add-on, as well as a training optional add-on. Um, all of the base grant activities and all mentorship outcomes are now fixed funding. So that means as you're applying, you do not have to provide budget details on those objectives, uh, nor do you have to provide um, proof of the use of those funds at the end of this for the reporting. So hopefully that is taking out a, a significant um, administrative burden for you all. And um, again, this is all changes that we're making from the feedback that we get from, from you guys as um, as our grantees. So we appreciate that and hope this is a, 
uh, welcome change. So some other changes for CY 2025 to 27, um, we have some additional training options for track one. So it's no longer just uh, the SABA workshop that you can use that training funding for um, and additional uh, funding options for track two as well, which we will go through. Um, the, the mentee funding amount has been reduced to $10,000 and that's with the goal of being able to make more awards um, in, in the mentorship grants. Um, we've also, the track three base funding has been reduced to $10,000 per year. It is a three-year award, so that's $30,000 total for the three years. Um, capacity building is now only offered as an add-on option through track three. Um, that's another three-year award, so those are going to be done concurrently if you choose that option. We've expanded compa capacity building um, to support retail food safety networks. We have some clear guidance on special projects with some additional support for those networks. And then we do have a new reporting requirement for um, grantees in this cycle. Um, it's the SA9 and CSIP development tool, which NEHA will provide training on. And all again, with the, um, with the goal in mind of streamlining this process and improving data sharing. Okay, so there are five grant types available for CY 2025 the three base grants, track one, track two, and track three, and they all have optional um, add-ons specified for each type of grant. So for track one, you can do mentee and training. For track two, uh, you can add mentee training and standard nine support, as well as um, an updated SA9 if you need it. And for track three, you can do all of these um, optional add-ons. There are also two additional grants that would be a separate, separate grant application, excuse me, for track two and track three applicants, um, a mentorship optional add-on to become a mentor instead of a mentee. And then the special projects optional add-on grant is also available through a separate application. Okay, so going through track one uh, base grants, um, to be eligible, the only thing that you need for these is to be enrolled in the retail standards. Um, it is a fixed funding for all of the all of the deliberal deliverables, except for the training funds, excuse me. Um, and the required outcomes for this grant are the completion of a self-assessment of all nine standards and your comprehensive strategic improvement plan. So your CSIP, that's going to get you five thousand um, dollars. You have the option to also apply for funding for training to either attend um, the SABA workshop, CFP or um, any of the FDA regional seminars. You do have to provide a budget as you are filling out that application and you can request up to $7,500. And again, this is something that as you do your reporting at the end of the grant cycle, you'll have to provide um, receipts and, and uh, documentation for those expenses. The other optional outcome you have for track one is the um, mentee option, which is fixed funding of $10,000. So with this one track one application, you can um, request up to $22,500 for CY 2025. Um, track two is a little bit more complex. We have um, for eligibility, you do need to still be enrolled in the standards and you need to have a current SA9 and CSIP. Um, so for this year, that's gonna be uh, August 1, 2019 or later. Um, it is, again, fixed funding for the base grant deliverables as well as the mentorship. Um, you are required for a track two base grant to work on at least one of standards one through eight, and that's going to get you a fixed funding of $5,000 as well. Um, you do then have the option to also work toward meeting standard nine, and that, um, that funding is going to vary depending on the risk fa factor study approach that you take. So, um, the file study approach is going to be $5,000. The data collection or hybrid approach is fixed funding of $10,000. And we do have um, a, a much a broader explanation of these different um, risk factor studies in both the guidance and available on the website. Um, you have the optional outcome of adding uh, retail food safety training up to $7,500, again, with that detailed budget. And then you have the, the optional outcome of being a mentee for another $10,000. Um, finally, you have the option if you are within 12 months of expiration of your SA9, you can apply for an additional $3,000 to update that SA9 as a part of your track two development based grant. So that's gonna give you an option of up to $35,500 all through this one track two application 
for CY25. All right, <laughs> this is the big one. <laughs> uh, track three. So in order to apply for track three, and this is um, this is different than it has been, you do need to be enrolled in the um, in the standards, have your current SA90 and CSIP, and you must have successfully met and audited at least three different standards in the last five years. So um, as of August 2019 through December of this year. Um, if you receive a, a track three grant, you are required to maintain all the standards that you have already met, as well as meet one new standard of standards one through eight uh, by the end of the three-year grant period. That's going to get you $10,000 per year over the three years. Um, you are also required to work on standard nine. Um, so that's our risk factor study. And again, with that differentiation between the different types of um, risk factor studies, so $5,000 per year for the file study or $10,000 um, per year for the data collection or hybrid approach. <clears throat> you can again request um, training with a detailed budget. Um, the mentee option is available for track three applicants at $10,000. This is um, the training and the mentee are just for one year, so you would have to uh, reapply for those annually. Um, you have the same option as track two to update your SA-9 if you are expiring for $3,000. And then the big, ad, um, the big optional outcome is adding that capacity building component. Um, that is also a three-year grant at $100,000 maximum per year, and it does require a detailed budget. So obviously there's a, a wide uh, range of funding available through track three. Um, capacity building. So again, only for track three applicants, um, we do expect this to be highly competitive. Um, so consider whether or not that's something that you want to take on. Um, the capacity building grants can, um, can support the retail program standards coordinator for up to one FTE. Um, a required outcome for that would be to meet two additional standards. In addition to your track three base grant, so a total of three additional standards should be met over the grant period. For a network coordinator, um, it can fund up to one FTE as well with the requirement um, of meeting your track three base grant, um, base grant uh, objectives and the specific network outcomes. Um, you can fund a combination of RPS and network coordinator for up to one FTE, and then you must meet an additional one standard, um, as well as your requirements for track three, so two additional standards over the grant period, plus the specific network outcomes. And um, other retail standards, conformance projects will also be considered um, as long as they increase RPS conformance. Um, and ideally, they have this kind of network component where it, the effects reach beyond a single jurisdiction. Um, again, this is going to be a detailed budget for up to $3,000 for, I'm sorry, $300,000 for the full three years. And I know we'll have questions about this, so we will uh, be happy to answer those. All right, so if you're a track two or track three applicant, you can also, instead of applying to be a mentee in your base grant, you can apply to be a mentor with an optional add-on grant. So um, this is a separate grant application. Um, you will, it's a fixed funding um, grant, but you will also have um, a variance in the amount that you're awarded based on the number of mentees that you take on. So it's between $6,000 and $18,000 for your mentorship support. Um, you are required to complete a site visit with your mentor, or I'm sorry, with your mentee, and um, also to attend that end of year meeting with NICHO. <clears throat> so this is going to be between $12,000 and $24,000 um, additional dollars for mentors. Um, Jenna, we have a raised hand. Um, Nicole Needs, is, is she able to talk, uh, Evan? I just get rid of you. Okay. Nicole. All right, we'll keep moving, but Nicole, feel free to um, raise your hand again or put a question in chat or or, or even better, the Q&A. And then uh, we just, we want to do a little plug for encouraging people to be a mentor um, again or for the first time. Um, I know it's come up a few times that you do not have to be an expert in everything to be a mentor. If you feel like you 
have recently um, made some kind of achievement that you could walk somebody else through. That's certainly something that we can match you up with uh, with a mentee and let you, um, you know, provide your your support to them. So um, please do apply if uh, if you feel that's right for you. And then finally, we have the um, special projects optional add-on. So again, this is a separate grant application for only track two or track three applicants. Um, and this is going to be um, projects that advance the retail program standards and support the integrated food safety system. Um, projects that uh, support the sustainable retail food safety networks um, are going to be considered, but you can also put together um, other ideas that that will be um, will be considered as well. And this is going to be um, requiring a detailed budget and with a maximum funding of twenty thousand dollars. And we do have additional guidance on these projects as well. All right, thank you, Jenna. Um, I'll take over these next couple slides. Um, you know, just three things, it, it, particularly if you're new to the root program standards, you could be working on an application as early as tomorrow. So the steps, if you want one of these grants and you've never been part of the retail program standards before, the first step is to enroll with FDA. Um, and we do have, uh, even though this is a NEHA website, it's going to walk you through how to turn that information into FDA. Enrollment in the Voluntary National Retail Food Regulatory Program Standards, what we call the Retail Program Standards, that is an FDA action, but you can do that. And once you enroll, you're good to go for the program. You can then register for the program, which also will take you usually, it, it'll take probably five or 10 minutes to fill out the registration. It might take us a couple hours, as much as a day to connect your registration, but you'll be getting a username and, an, uh, and, a, and a password and you can get into the system. So really consider it if you're a first time um, we'll talk a little bit more about track one, but track one is great for someone who doesn't know anything about the standards. They want to enroll, they want to learn, they want to take the first few steps. Uh, you know, entering in track one and asking for a mentee to be a mentee is, is a great way to start. Uh, another slide, um, we want to really be sure, and, and this is where we get most of our questions. If you're going to apply, make sure you are eligible for the track you apply for. And so track one, Really, the only requirement is you must be enrolled in the retail program standards. But we do have um, we do have people that have been enrolled, have done an, a self assessment, and then maybe it's out of date and they can start over in track one. Or maybe maybe you had a a, a, a self assessment of all nine standards completed in 2020, 2021, 2021, but that person's left the agency. Um, that that's who track one is for. With one caveat. Track one is not for people to come into more than once. So if you've never gotten a, a, a NEHA FDA RFFM grant before, uh, in that in this program started with calendar year 2022. So for the last three years, if you have not gotten a grant through this program and you feel like you need to redo your SA9, even if it's not all the way expired and do a CSIP, you can, you can enter through track one. If you have gotten a grant before, uh, and, and you've done an SA9, but not a CSIP, you should go ahead and do that CSIP and move into track two. And we do have some tools to help you get um, from track one to track two and to get track two ready. Uh, so if you have any questions about your eligibility for track one, um, reach out to us. We'll be giving you our email address and our phone number, but reach out and we will help get you to the right place. But for the most part, Track one is for the folks who have never used a track one grant before and who want to do both this SA9, redo that, or do it for the first time in a CSIP. Track two is when you're when you're done with your SA9 and CSIP. Uh, and again, uh, even if your CSIP is not perfect, you're going to have a chance to redo that and submit it at the end of the year. So consider being in track two. If you've got a, a valid within the last five years, and that means August 1, 2019 or later, you are eligible for track two. Get that CSIP um, uh, done if you need to. Uh, we can help you. Your, your your FDA RFS can help you. But that's a great place for for that those first steps past the self assessment of all nine standards. That's track two. And then track three, same eligibility as track two, um, but you also have to success, have successfully met and verified at least three different standards. You do have, if you've got to hurry up and get some work done and get your audit finished and get your paperwork complete, you do have until the end of this calendar year 
but just make sure if you're applying for track three, make sure that you're going to qualify. We would hate to have you not qualify and lose out for a year on funding. And, and I did want to just, if, if the rules are kind of complex, uh, they're kind of complex in, in a way that is really intended to help you all. But I, I want to just differentiate a little bit between track two and track three. Track two and track three are very similar now. Um, they offer all of the same options. The only dollar difference between track two and track three, and, and let's set aside capacity building for a second. The only dollar difference between track two and track three is 5,000 a year. The advantage of being in track three is you get that extra 5,000 a year and you get a three-year grant. And so you've got guaranteed funding for three years. These changes have been made to make the, the, the transition from track one to, I mean, I'm sorry, from track two to track three, a little bit more easy, but it's also these changes are going to make us able to give a lot more track three grants. So, you know, really consider that. And I guess what I want to say, it's not a bad thing to be in track two. Uh, it's it, You can do nearly as much in track two as you can with track three, with the exception of capacity building, but check out the rules, ask your questions, call us if you've got questions about that. And then um, capacity building is another thing entirely. It's going to be highly impetitive. Really think through, if you're going to go after capacity building, how are you going to help FDA and NEHA and all the partners, all the retail collaborative partners, how are you going to help move the retail program standards forward? I, I think more and more that, that, that the capacity building add-on in track three is going to really be about broadening the standards uh, nationwide. So really think through that. Read the eligibility carefully. There's a lot of them, uh, but I, I, I will say I, I expect it to be highly competitive. And I think the ones that have a greater impact are going to um, are going to uh, uh, are going to be the ones that get funded. They're going to be the ones that rise to the top. I've seen I've we've had some questions about specifics, and uh, there's some creative ideas brewing out there, and that's wonderful. And those are totally eligible. Just really think through how does this does this just hold people in place? or does it move them forward in the standards? That's really what we're starting to hope uh, for when we look at capacity building, but, um, um, and, and ask your questions and all that. So those are two important slides. The others is just thank you. You know, again, we're, we're so appreciative of the uh, states, locals, tribes, and territories who have applied, who've been grantees, who've given us great ideas. We hope, we, we really think that the admin burden is gonna be significantly lower for the next three years. We hope you agree, but we want your ideas. It's your ideas that led us to some of the streamlining. Again, we're so grateful for FDA, the, for the funding, for the specialists who do so much to make this program successful, to Mary Beth, our project officer, all the, the joint advisory group, the leadership group that, that gives so much to this program. And then also all of the different agency partners. Nate Show, who's a great partner with our mentorship, um, uh, Conference for Food Protection that does a lot with us um, over the three-year cycles. Uh, the Retail Collaborative, which includes AFTO and, and other organizations that are, are great partners, uh, AFTOS, others, and really, really thankful for, for all y'all. Again, I'll probably leave this up as we do the Q&A, but make plans to apply today. You've got our email address for questions after this call. Uh, we've got the grant guidance, a lot of really important stuff, but um, uh, uh, key dates, October 1, we opened. We're closing November 20. You still have uh, more than three weeks to apply or roughly about three weeks to apply. So uh, get those applications in. And with that, um, I will kick this over and uh, you guys can start putting forward questions or answering questions, however, however we're going to do that Q&A. Jess, uh, Jess, I think you're on the point here. Yep. Yeah, um, I can walk you through. We didn't get... Um quite as many this time, um, but we can walk through a couple of the ones that were uh, repeated. And then if anybody has any questions at the end, feel free to raise your hand. And Jess, I see one right off the top. Where can we find this PowerPoint? Uh, an earlier version, which is almost identical to this, is already posted on the on the website, uh, which is, um, I'll switch to the, uh, oh, it's kind of hidden on my screen, but it's, it's there. It's uh, down maybe below where your people, but retail, neha.org slash retail dash grants. Uh, you can get the PowerPoint there. We'll put this one up probably by tomorrow, but there's really just one minor slide change. So the PowerPoint that's up there right now is available to you. And Amber Kohlberg has her hand up.
Amber, feel free to speak. Um, Evan, is she good to go? Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, there we yes. go. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, so where do we find, or I guess how often is the log, I've seen it once in the past, a log of the different counties that have um, audited and met each standard? You know what I'm talking about? It's like, how often is that updated? Is, is yeah, that and where do we find it? Yeah, yeah you, can, you can find that. I mean, there's an FDA website, but if you go to neha.org dash retail program standards, and on the left side, there's a program resources menu. I think it's under the program resources little um, uh, selection. You can find the uh, the registry that's updated every three months. But Jessica, it was updated like just in the last couple of days, correct? Correct. On the 21st of October. OK. And okay. that doesn't mean it's always up to date. I mean, that, that there's a point in time that they update that every three months. It was just updated. But if you think it disagrees with your reality, make sure you reach out to your your retail program, uh, your FDA retail food specialist, but also reach out to us too. We can help kind of chase down any information that you think is erroneous on that posting. But we were super excited to see it get posted, uh, updated this week because it helped, the, you know, the more update uh, that is, the better for you all to really verify your uh, eligibility. Okay, and then I have another question, if I can, along that line. Please. Um, how often, I guess, do does each, like, if we've had one standard that was met and audited, how often do you do that same process? You're, you you are supposed to re-go through the process and, and re-audit a standard every time you do a, a, a new self-assessment, which is supposed to be done on about a five-year cycle. Okay. So, and there's some, there's some complexity and asterisks and things like that. Talk to your specialist, but, but essentially once every five years, um, uh, if, if there's Joe or anybody else on the call that wants to add to that, I'm not sure if Joe's on today. So ultimately it's updating. I mean, if you're going on that cycle, kind of, or kind of get on that cycle of update your CSIP, update your self-assessment of the standard, re audit and verify. If yeah, did, I, I would say the other way. <laughs> yeah, I would say complete yeah. the self-assessment of all nine standards, mm -hmm. work to meet standards for five years. And then mm -hmm. once you do the SA9 again, the updated SA9, you would re re-go through standards. Your CSIP honestly is is just a working document for you. I mean, a lot of you most folks probably want to update that every year. And we are going to be asking that as the in the grant program at the end of each year, we're going to be providing some guidance and some assistance, but we do want to see you update that every year. But it's really, it's your tool to use to 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 kind of track your progress. Uh, you know, basically record progress you made if you missed a mark, updating that and putting a new mark in place, et cetera. And I, yeah, so we do that, but is that ever uh, like, do we ever have to send that to you guys? We, we, we are. That's a new requirement. And it's really, and again, it's really just going to be more of a record keeping thing. But we mm -hmm. are going to, uh, as part of the grant program, we are going to begin asking for your CSIP, not only when you apply, but as, also at the end of each grant year. Okay, thank you. And, and we're also going to have some online tools in different ways that that can be really easy. Uh, although, you know, you'll still have some flexibility, but more coming on that. And I do, I'm gonna knock off the, Jessica, I see these questions. Uh, I'm just gonna go th through these quickly. Um, Alicia uh, Donathan, uh, a sustainability plan is required for the capacity building add-on. What are the expectations? Will any guidance be offered? Uh, we are going to provide a template. We're gonna provide guidance and assistance. So for those who win capacity building, don't let that be a worry for you. It's not gonna be a, a, a huge heavy lift. We just want you to be thinking about sustainability uh, over the, over the long run. Um, second question from Melissa Ham: Any plans to create a CSIPS for capacity building or networks? I hate to ask, in that we could make this a deliverable. Um, Melissa, I'm not quite following you, but I, I might have answered that already. That we are going to be asking for CSIPS of grantees, um, and you know, I, I do think if if you're leading a network. Anybody who's a grantee is going to have to start doing those CSIPs. Uh, they're already required to apply for track two, but that is that is something we think should be a routine for y'all. Again, it's just a plan. Once you build it, 
Tweaking it is not a heavy burden. We just want to get people in the habit of really tracking their progress and keeping it up to date. And again, we're going to hopefully within the next three months or the first three months of the calendar year, we're going to have some online tools that can hopefully make that really easy for you. We also are working to get some tools available that can take your CSIP and enter all that. In, I mean, I'm sorry, take your self-assessment of all nine standards, enter that data into a CSIP template so you can just take it a little further to complete your CSIP. So more mm -hmm. coming on that. And Melissa, if there's more to that, feel free to put another question in or, um, or uh, I see you have one down there. Uh, uh, Oh, um, thinking a network CSIP would need to include tracking progress of all enrollees. I don't think that, I don't think we would ask for that and listen, never say never, but I, I think we, I think the CSIP really is a tool for a jurisdiction. You, we may want you, and we do want you to encourage the jurisdictions in a network to complete a CSIP, but unless they're a grantee, it wouldn't have to be turned into anyone. Hopefully that's more clear. Um, Travis McDaniel, where can we find guidance for local business managers relating to appropriate accounting fiscal pra practices related to these awarded funds? Um, this is this this grant program is only for state, local, tribal, and territorial jurisdictions that that uh, regulate retail food. They're not really for for industry. So, um, but any, if you get our grant guidance, there are some federal links in there and that's where, you know, that's where the, more of the deeper um, uh, federal guidance would come into play. David Boberg, I see for mentorship, can those site visits be virtual and do we know the date location for the end of year meeting in 2025? Um, yes, um, we really do like to see those live site visits, but if you need to do it virtual because of, Distance, time, other conflicts, it's definitely permissible. Uh, virtual is permissible. Um, and uh, so um, so the answer to that is, is yes. And then end of year meeting, I'm not sure. I know it's about the same time of year. Is anybody on the call that knows if we have a date already for next year? I know they're actively in one this year, so it, it might not be available yet. But roughly end of October you know, about this time, this time next year. All right, Jess, what else should we be hitting? Um, I think you pretty much got it. Um, otherwise, for those of you that are new, um, we had a couple of people who have just submitted their enrollment with the FDA and concerned about not knowing the official enrollment date. Uh, once you do enroll, feel free to use that date that you submitted to the FDA, your enrollment, and then we'll verify everything with the FDA. So don't don't hold off in uh, setting up your account to review your applications, uh, waiting on that date. We will verify that for you. So um, no issues there. Um, and Jess, I'll just add to that. Um, there is a history. There's a question on all the base grants about your history with the RFFM grant program. Just put that in there. Hey, on October 15th, we enrolled and we sent the information to our RFS, who is this person's name. Just put that in there and then that helps us verify that. Yep, perfect. Um, and then I, I think that's pretty much it. There there were a couple of people who are new. Um, they're new to their jurisdiction and their SA-9s were done in around 2022, but no CSIP is completed. Um, so concerns about which track to be eligible for if the CSIP is, or if the SA-9 is current, but the CSIP is not, that yeah. seems to be repetitive. And we, did, and we did get clarification from FDA on that last week. Um, if you have never gotten funding from this program and you feel like I really need to update that SA-9 as a starting point, go in track one. But if you've already gotten a track one grant in either 2022, 2023, or 2024, go ahead and do that CSIP and, and go into track two. You're not going to be, you're not eligible for track one twice, I guess is what I'm saying. And that only, that doesn't apply to the past grants through, through AFTO. That only applies to grants through this program, the RFFM grant program, which began in calendar year 2022. So hopefully that's clear enough. But if you are not absolutely certain Reach out. We'll put that in writing. We'll get you a solid answer. 
Um, and then one more real quick. Um, Abby is asking, does track three maintenance require audits, even if it is not your self-assessment year during the three-year grant cycle? Say, say that again, Jess, my, my apologies. No, you're okay. Does track three maintenance require a, audits, even if it's not your self-assessment year during the three-year grant cycle? No, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because I, I did think about that when we were going through the slides. The, the idea of you must maintain all your standards, things happen, right? We understand that you might be meeting a standard and you might lose your compliance with it. All we're asking is that we're not, we're not just cycling through the same standards over and over again. We want to see you guys making progress. And so uh, no extra rules. It's really, you know, I mean, the idea in general is you you complete your self-assessment of all nine standards and then you spend five years meeting and maintaining standards and then you're making progress over time. Once you get up to meeting all the standards, you know, uh, conceivably some of you will want to be in a stage where you've met all nine standards or you've met all that you can possibly meet with your local regulations and you're going to be in a maintenance mode and you'll just be maintaining and that's that's perfectly acceptable in track two or track three. Um, and then, uh, Shauna, I just sent you the link, um, there on the NEHA website, there is a frequently asked questions tab. Um, and there's a lot of information on there about risk factor studies, and it, it does a great job of breaking down different parts of each grant. Um, so it's just, uh, NEHA.org frequently asked questions and you can, um, get some more information on, she was specifically asking about standard nine. Um, so we do address the different uh, risk factor studies there. And I'll just say a little bit more about that, Jessica. St Standard nine is for most people a multi-year, uh, really for everybody, it's a multi-year cycle. It might be a three-year cycle, might be a five-year cycle. Um, the, the grant is set up that you, whatever you, your approach you use, and, which is really your data collection method and how the, how the, how you, you, how you either combine or don't combine um, uh Stand, risk factor uh, visits versus inspections. Um, whatever your end goal is, whatever approach you're using, you either get five thousand if you do the simpler approach, or ten thousand per year. And you're in your, you know, it's only going to be rare that you're actually going to meet an audit standard nine. That's going to be one out of five years. You might, it might take you four years to get there. So the intent of those grants, and and that's what that's one of the improvements we've made whether you're in track two or whether you're in track three, you get the same amount of money um, and you have the same options to approach those, to use the approach that best serves your needs. And again, there is some, um, the, uh, I think it's about a year old now, but FDA, we have it posted on the NEHA website, but FDA has some standard nine guidance and the risk factor study guidance that is just top notch and really clear. Definitely make sure you check that out. I might not have said this clearly enough, but every one of you has a, uh, a FDA retail food specialist assigned to your state or your area. Uh, you can find that on our website or FDA's website. There's a link to those RFS names. Um, that's your resource uh, for meeting, for working through the standards. They also know a lot about this grant program. They are the best people to ask for advice. Uh, and so definitely make sure that you clear, you know, you might want to talk to them. You might want to ask them what they think you should, you know, get their advice on plans for the future. And, uh, and again, if there's anything that's unclear about the grant program, reach out to us, but uh, don't, don't forget, you've got a partner in the field that is top notch in your, in your FDA RFS. Um, Amber does have her hand up if we've got time for another one. Yeah. Sorry if this was a Samber, I didn't lower it. Sorry. Oh, oh okay. Um, one more from Jake. If we are under MOU with the state we are located in and they have completed some specific standards, does this mean that they that we meet these specific standards as well? Um Jake, that's a that's a that's a hard question to answer in a generic sense. I, states are set up so very different. Um call with your specific circumstance. 
Um, and, and also talk to your specialists. I mean, there are, there are states, there are states that every local health department is its own jurisdiction. There are states like Florida, where there's just a few agencies that, 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 uh, that split up the retail, um, uh, retail focus. Then there's also states where there's kind of a combination of it's a state agency, but they've got local branches. So that's definitely a hard question to answer, but ask that question. That's really important. And I, and I do really, I want us to think through how do we help states like Florida, where they're all state agencies, how do we help them really do good field work on the standards? Um, so I, I think there's some things that we haven't really thought through or haven't haven't figured out yet, but um, Jake, we'd love to an answer any specifics on that. And if you want to, and um, if you want to come off, if you want to put your hand up and ask a question verbally, or if you want to put some more details in there, we're happy to answer those now as well, to the extent we can. All right, um, any more questions? If you have questions, you can go ahead. We'll say a couple more things, but you can go ahead and um, and um, put those in the Q&A or the chat if you'd like. But we are, uh, like, like we said, this PowerPoint should be posted by tomorrow or, or definitely this week. So in the next couple of days, this PowerPoint will be posted. The one that's already posted from the October 1 webinar is really the same, so you can get that right away. Uh, great information on the website. Um, and um, Jess or Jen, or uh, Jessica, any other any other things that you would add that we've forgotten? Or Carol? Just that we'll update the, the FAQs as well to include questions asked at this webinar. Yep. Thank you. I forgot about that. Yep. We're going to, we're going to add to the FAQs. There's some good FAQs out there, but we're always an email away uh, or a phone call away. I'm seeing some more questions. Am I? Oh no, I'm seeing old questions. Sorry. <laughs> Jess, are we good? Yeah, I don't see anything else coming in. Um, I see an answer from David Boberg for Jake Anderson. There are good clarifications on state local relationships in the clearinghouse document too. Um, David, if you can give us a link or something like that, we can definitely put that in the FAQs. But we'd love to love to help on that. And again, don't be afraid if 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 you're in a jurisdiction that you don't know the answers, feel free to reach out and ask those questions and let's figure out a way to help you do the best work you can in the field. I mean, that's really the, the hope of this program. All right, I think without further ado, we can close this out. I um, wanna thank you for participating. And again, like I said, you've got about three weeks to finish up those applications. Make sure that you submit and confirm before the evening of um, October, or I'm sorry, November 20. That portal closes at uh, 7.59 Eastern time. We're given all the way up to five o'clock on the, on the West Coast. Uh, sorry, Guam and Saipan and some of you others, you'll have to get it in a, a little bit before business closes on the 20th. You might wanna shoot for the 19th if you're in a Pacific territory, November 19th. Thanks to everyone, and uh, we'll close this out and um, get this video posted uh, in the next couple of days and get the PowerPoint posted as well.